Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk here about platelet disorders. Uh, two of these four that we're going to talk about come up very frequently, and then the other two are kind of distractors, but they come up more on step one and two. So we will talk about them, and it helps to talk about all three of these uh, intrinsic platelet defects um, because there is a test um, that is used for diagnosis, um, and it can be a little tricky, and understanding all three of them will help you understand that test. So we'll get into that. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel uh, by hitting the little box on the bottom right and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so we're going to talk about von Willebrand's. As you can imagine, that's the most common. Glanzmann's, Bernard Soulier, although we're going to talk about these in a different order. And then we'll talk about ITP, which is also fairly common. All right, this is the process of clot formation. Um, so we start out with adhesion. Von Willebrand's factor is uh, expressed on the subendothelium. So if you break a vessel, for instance, little tiny capillary, uh, Von Willebrand's factor is exposed. The platelet recognizes it via GP1B, which is a glycoprotein expressed on the platelet surface. Um, once you get that adhesion, the platelet uh, will release ADP and thr thromboxane A2. Remember, thromboxane A2, uh, the, uh, the function of that, the, the um, formation of that is inhibited by aspirin, which is why aspirin works as an antiplatelet drug. Um, and then after that, then platelets come to the site and uh, begin to aggregate and adhere to one another. Uh, that process is, uh, is, works via GP2B3A, which is another glycoprotein expressed on the surface, as well as fibrinogen. Then we get stabilization, and this is kind of the, uh, the convergence of the coagulation cascade, which gives us factor 13A. Um, and, and what will happen here is that, uh, that that fibrinogen mesh will become a much stronger fibrin mesh, and this is a much more stable clot. Okay, now platelet-type bleeding um, has a number of manifestations, but I bold-faced the most common ones. Easy bruising. Patients get a bruise. They don't know where it came from. You know, we all get bruises. You stub your toe or whack your arm up against the wall or something. I don't know. Um, and you get a bruise and you know why you got it. These patients will get bruises and they don't know why they've got it. Petechiae purpura, you know what those look like, ecchymoses, menorrhagia. So these are women who they bleed a lot. They go through multiple tampons more than they should. Um, and, you know, there's a number for that. But on your exam, they'll just tell you she's got a heavy flow. Epistaxis, that is nosebleeds, gingival bleeding. The gingiva is very, very delicate tissue and also very highly vascularized. So you're brushing your teeth. You shouldn't bleed from that. But if you bleed and you bleed and you bleed from your gums and there's no reason for it, look for a platelet deficiency. And then hematuria and occult GI bleeds. Uh, these are petechiae and purpura. They really just differ based on their size. And they, be, they can become confluent as well. All right. So when you get a patient with easy bruising or these platelet-type bleeding symptoms, what we need to do is the most important step, and that's a CBC with peripheral smear. Now, the CBC will confirm that the patient indeed has a platelet deficiency. Um, that's going to be very important uh, because whether or not their platelets are low will give us a hint because there are two ways that you can get platelet type bleeding. You can either have deficient platelets or you can have defective platelets and sometimes you can have both. Okay, so we need to find out what we're dealing with. If they have a thrombocytopenia and platelet type bleeding, well, it's thrombocytopenia, it's deficient platelets. But if their platelet count is normal and they have platelet type bleeding, well, then we're looking at defective platelets, especially von Willebrand's. Uh, we'll get a BMP uh, because uremia can cause platelet type bleeding, can uh, make it difficult for platelets to work. Get a PTPTT, you'll see why. Ristocetin cofactor assay, von Willebrand factor antigen, factor eight level. All of these are options on CCS. This is the Ristocetin platelet test or Ristocetin cofactor assay. Basically what this does is Ristocetin will 
encourage platelet adhesion. Now, it says aggregation, uh, but that's not a good word. We're talking aggregation here in vitro. Okay, so what this is actually testing is adhesion, but when you see the adhesion, it'll look like aggregation. Okay, so what we are doing here is we are checking the interaction between von Willebrand's factor and GP1B. If either of those are defective, then it, the, the test is gonna be abnormal. So normally, we, uh, we, we take the blood, we add ristocetin, and we get aggregation. That's it. That's exactly how it should happen. Now, with von Willebrand's disease and bernard soulier syndrome, because von Willebrand's is a, a deficiency in von Willebrand's factor and bernard soulier is a, a deficiency or defect of GP1B, they're both going to lead to abnormal results, but in slightly different ways. So let's first start with von Willebrand's. This is an autosomal dominant uh, condition where we have a deficiency of von Willebrand's factor, and we also have a minor factor VIII deficiency, okay? But not enough to cause factor type bleeding. Symptoms here, platelet type bleeding, often this presents in young women with menorrhagia. Um, so here we'll have a elevated bleeding time. That's just, elevated bleeding time just means it's platelet bleeding, okay? Um, so the bleeding time will be elevated, PT will be normal, PTT will be normal or elevated owing to that factor eight deficiency, minor factor eight deficiency. It's not going to cause uh, a uh, hemophilia. It's just a minor deficiency that can show up on labs. Platelet count will be normal. There's nothing wrong with the number of platelets. They're defective platelets. CBC may show iron deficiency anemia, particularly if you're talking about a young woman who's got menorrhagia. She's bleeding every month fairly heavily, um, so you've got to keep an eye out for that. Uh, the most accurate diagnostic test is the Ristocetin platelet test that I already showed, um, also known as the Ristocetin cofactor assay. Same thing. So when we add Ristocetin, we get poor aggregation. Why is that? Well, because we're missing the von Willebrand's factor, so there's nothing for these platelets to aggregate with. However, when we add normal serum, not serum from the patient, normal serum that has von Willebrand's factor, then we get normalization. The GP1B is fine. Add von Willebrand's factor. Everything happens the way it should. Okay, remember that the serum only has von Willebrand's factor. It doesn't have GP1B because GP1B is part of the platelet. Okay, so we add von Willebrand's factor. Everything normalizes. It's von Willebrand disease. Okay. So the treatment here, if they're mild bleeding or they're pre-op, we give DDAVP, also known as desmopressin. If they're more severe bleeding, then you can give a von Willebrand factor concentrate. This is not an option on CCS though, but you should know it for your multiple choice questions. Uh, also avoid aspirin and NSAIDs because that simply gets in the way of this process. All right, bernard soulier syndrome is super rare, uh, but it does come up on tests. Here we have an abnormal GP1B expression. So remember, von Willebrand factor and GP1B are both important for adhesion. If you lack GP1B, you basically are going to get the same process as von Willebrand's disease, but you're lacking the other thing, the GP1B. Symptoms here, identical, platelet-type bleeding. Labs, pretty much identical, but the difference is going to be that the PTT will be normal in bernard soulier syndrome. Uh, whereas it can be elevated in von Willebrand's. But here's uh, one of the more salient features. You can have giant platelets, okay? We don't exactly know why that happens, uh, but uh, these megakaryocytes in the bloodstream, if you see them uh, with a von Willebrand's-like picture, it could be Bernard Soulier. Best diagnostic test here, Ristocetin cofactor assay. What is, now how is this gonna look? Well. So it's gonna be the same when we add ristocetin because we are lacking either or, von Willebrand's factor or GP1B. So we're gonna get poor aggregation, in, vi in vitro aggregation. And then when we add the serum, well, we're adding von Willebrand factor, but that's not the problem. The problem is the GP1B. And we're not adding GP1B when we add normal serum. We're adding von Willebrand's factor. So you're not gonna get a normal a normalization. You're not going to get aggregation when you add the normal serum. So um, consequently, uh, you'll have poor aggregation no matter what. And that's what separates Bernard Soulier from von Willebrand's uh, disease on the cofactor assay. 
treatment here. If there's active bleeding, tranexamic acid or amino caproic acid, these are uh, the this is the go-to therapy because giving DDAVP is not going to work. That helps you make or release von Willebrand factor. That is not the problem here. If there's life-threatening bleeding, transfuse platelets. Okay, that will be nice because it's the platelets that are defective here. Okay, um, so those platelets will then have GP1B. And then, of course, avoid antiplatelet drugs. Glanzmann's thrombostenia is a problem with aggregation. Okay, so adhesion is fine. It's aggregation. And it's a defective GP2B3A on the platelets. So we talked about what that did. Uh, the symptoms here are platelet-type bleeding. The labs are going to be uh, what we would expect. So an elevated bleeding time, normal PTPTT. Platelet count is going to be normal. CBC may show an iron deficiency anemia. Um, again, go for the risk to seat and cofactor assay. You're going to do it because it's the same identical clinical picture as the other two. And what you'll see here is normal aggregation and uh, both when you uh, add the ristocetin, and then if you were to add normal serum, which you wouldn't need to do, uh, you, you have a normal test uh, to begin with, okay? So what that's telling you is that even though we're saying aggregation here with this ristocetin cofactor assay, what it's really testing is the ability of adhesion in, vi in, vi sorry, in vivo, okay? Um, so what this is telling you then is that we have a problem of in vivo aggregation. All right. So normal uh, here, it could be a normal person or it could be uh, Glanzmann's thrombostenia. Treatment here, if there's active bleeding, you can do a platelet transfusion. Otherwise, of course, avoid antiplatelet drugs. This is kind of a general guideline of when we transfuse. So for, if we've got a patient uh, who has thrombocytopenia, um, the only time we really uh, have to transfuse them if they're below 10,000. Uh, but there are other times where we may transfuse them at a higher level, notably surgery at 50,000. And if it's neurosurgery or a CNS procedure because there's such a high risk of bleeding and because bleeding would be so deleterious, uh, we would transfuse them at 100,000. Okay, ITP is an acute thrombocytopenia due to an unknown mechanism. So here we're talking about a quantitative platelet issue. The other three were qualitative. There's something wrong with the platelets. Here it's just we don't have enough. This is often associated with autoimmune diseases. It's thought to have an autoimmune mechanism, but we don't know for sure. It is a diagnosis of exclusion here. So you can imagine then we're going to be running a number of labs. Symptoms, again, platelet-type bleeding. Very important on physical exam to exclude splenomegaly, uh, which can indicate splenic sequestration of platelets. That is not a small deal. You can uh, sequester up to 90% of your platelets. Uh, the labs would show an isolated thrombocytopenia, and some of the platelets could be large. That's the megakaryocytes. Now, if the thrombocytopenia is accompanied by an anemia, and also maybe a leukocytosis or a leukopenia, then we're thinking of the possibility of a bone marrow malignancy, like a leukemia. So in those patients, get a bone marrow biopsy. But if it's just isolated thrombocytopenia, don't have to do it. Okay, I don't know why I included this here. Okay, so the treatment for ITP is prednisone, okay? Uh, the recommendation is just to do it if they're below 30,000 or symptomatic, uh, but just know that the treatment for ITP is prednisone, uh, and that's, again, reflecting its likely autoimmune nature. Second-line treatment, IVIG, Rogam, may be added to the prednisone for a faster effect if that's necessary, like if they need surgery. Um, otherwise, splenectomy uh, can be useful as well. These are some of the other causes of thrombocytopenia. We got TTP, uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, uremia-induced platelet dysfunction, which we kind of alluded to, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, drug-induced thrombocytopenia. This one can look very similar to ITP. Uh, myelodysplastic syndromes, which we kind of alluded to, HELP syndrome, which is an obstetrical problem. Uh, it is a complication of preeclampsia. And then DIC. Okay, so I highlighted the stuff in red that really sticks out for each of these, but you are responsible for all of these on your exam. 
And then this is just a recap. Uh, I just want to, uh, I want you to know what platelet type bleeding looks like. When you have platelet type bleeding, you need to determine whether you have a thrombocytopenia. If not, then it's a qualitative platelet defect. Once you know it's qualitative, get a risk to seat and platelet test. That will help you differentiate, but do know von Willebrand's disease is far, far, far and away the most common uh, of the qualitative platelet defects. And if a patient has very, very low platelets, think ITP and remember to treat that with prednisone.